Welcome everyone. I'm uh, back with part two, the characteristics of confrontation. Do you confront when you shouldn't? And do you avoid confronting when you should? A story in the Bible highlights this struggle when a strong religious leader confronts a woman who is behaving as though drunk, but she is actually in anguish crying out to God because she can't conceive a child. The leader aggressively confronts her based on only appearances and before he knows the facts. The same leader who confronts when he shouldn't is later guilty of not confronting when he should. He fails to confront two contemptible sons when they abuse their position as priests and take advantage of God's people. God rebukes Eli for his passivity because he fails to protect the people under his care. So I back to the original question. Do you confront when you shouldn't? And do you avoid confronting when you should? Fear of conflict can make you passive so that you do nothing. And misunderstanding can cause you to confront inappropriately. Knowing when and how to confront requires wisdom. In his old age, Eli finally confronts his sons, but by then it's too late. Eli pays a high price for being too passive for too long. God tells Eli he will judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13, what determines when you should confront? There are, t there are times when confronting someone does more damage than good. And there are times when confronting someone serves God's purpose. How can you know whether it's the right time or the wrong time to confront? There's a proper time and procedure for every matter. When you should confront when someone is in danger, some people say or do things that hurt themselves or others to the extent that their lives are at risk. God opposes all abusive behavior, whether it is self-inflicted or inflicted upon others. You need to intervene when you see any behavior that puts people in harm's way. Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? When a relationship is threatened, relationships are vulnerable to damaging words or actions. You need to confront when necessary to preserve the relationship. I plead with you, Eudea, and I plead with Sina. Sintaish. To be <laughs> to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause in in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co workers whose names are in the book of life. When division exists within a group, one of the enemy's tactics is to cause quarrels strife and jealousy among believers. God calls us to unity, agreement, and peace. He charges us to guard and protect the precious relationships we have with brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. When someone sins against you, 
difficult though it may be, God gives you a clear directive to confront anyone who does something to you that clearly violates God's will in regard to how you are to be treated. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. When you are offended, sometimes you can be offended by someone's actions, even when the actions are not sinful. For the sake of, for the sake of the relationship, confronting in humility and expressing your concern provides the other person the opportunity to be sensitive to you in the future and to avoid offending you by discontinuing the offensive actions. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the, through the bond of peace. When someone is caught in a sin, at times you will see sin in others to which they are blind while guarding against the possibility of the same sin in your own life. God wants you, God wants to use you to expose the sin and help the one trapped to overcome it. When I, God, say to the, to a wicked person, you will surely die and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person will die for their sin and I will hold you accountable for their blood. When others are offended, sometimes confronting on behalf of others is inappropriate. In cases of prejudice, injustice, or violence toward those unable to defend themselves, God expects you to take up their cause and speak out against the wrong done to them. Even the Apostle Paul confronted Peter when it was necessary to do so. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 13, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when the Jews arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Forgive, then confront. Question. Why can't I just forgive and forget? Why do I have to confront someone when they offend me? Undisclosed forgiveness benefits you by keeping you from becoming bitter. But it does not necessarily benefit your offender who is in need of correction. Yes, you need to forgive and not dwell on the offense, but you also need you also need to confront in order to make your offender aware of a problem in need of being addressed. Forgiving without confronting can later result in your offender resenting you for not caring enough to make the offense known so that the bad behavior could be changed. Your offender could then develop a bitter root that later bears bitter fruit. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. What determines when you should not confront? Confrontation can create unity, but it can also divide, especially when done at the wrong time in the wrong way, under the wrong circumstances. By the, by, by the wrong person or to the wrong person. For example, the Bible gives us instruction as to how to properly confront an older person. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. To avoid needless damage, you should not confront when you are, when you are not the right person to confront. If you are not the one offended or not responsible for the one offended, you may not be the one who should confront. However, God might use you to help the person who bears the responsibility of confronting. In Proverbs chapter 26, 
verse 17, like one who grabs a stray dog by the ears is someone who rushes into a quarrel, not their own. Two, when it's not the right time to confront, you may be the right person to do the confronting, but it may not be the right time or your heart may not be right. And Ecclesiastes chapter three, verses one and seven, there is a time for everything, a time to be silent and a time to speak. When you are uncertain of the facts, be sure you are fully informed of what is happening. Sometimes asking the right questions and listening objectively will, will reveal that you are simply misperceiving the situation. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. When it's best to overlook a minor offense, you may find that overlooking minor offenses allow God to convict others of their errors. When in doubt, erring on the side of restraint and mercy is gen is generally best. Whoever would foster love covers over an offense. When you are committing the same sin, paradoxically, you can be most offended by people who are engaging in the very behaviors with which you yourself struggle. You would be hypocritical in correcting others when you are guilty of doing the same thing. First, correct your own behavior. Then you can help correct the behavior of someone else. In Matthew chapter seven, verses three through five, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. When your motive is purely to satisfy your own rights, not to benefit the other person, a my rights attitude will only damage the spirit of, of a positive confrontation. Therefore, consider another's interests over your own. In Philippians chapter two, verses three through four, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, va value others above yourselves, not not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of to the interest of the others. When you have a vindictive motive, before you confront, genuine forgiveness of the offender is imperative. In your heart, release the offender into the hands of God. You must not confront out of a secret desire to take revenge or to get even. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. When the consequences of the confrontation outweigh those of the offense, look at the, look at the degree of the offense before you confront. Some battles pay little dividends and are just not worth the fight. Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 1. When the person you want to confront has a habit of foolishness and quarreling, avoid confronting people who are unwilling to recognize their offense. If you, if you cannot avoid the confrontation, you may need to take others with you to help in confronting these persons. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 through 24, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. When setting aside your rights will benefit an unbeliever. Jesus models suffering for righteousness sake and exhorts you to endure unjust hardship for the sake of exposing God's character to an unbeliever. Allow room for God to work in another person's heart by showing restraint. 
It is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. When the person who offended you is your enemy, sometimes it is best not to confront those who oppose you but to seek to win them over by praying for them and blessing them with unexpected kind acts. You and your offender are ultimately responsible to God for your actions. The path to peace might mean forgiving and blessing your offender without ever confronting the offensive behavior. In Matthew chapter five, verses 44 through 45, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. When confrontation will be ineffective, you may not be able to effectively confront a person who has a violent temper and who is and who is likely to act severe retribution on you or on someone you love however with such a person you still need to have and enforce proper boundaries in in proverbs chapter 9 verse 7 whoever corrects a mocker invites insults whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse Confronting fellow believers. Question. If I have a Christian friend who is continuing to live in sin, am I obligated to confront them? Realize that you may be God's agent to help your friend change and then grow to become more Christ-like. If you care enough to confront, God can use you to encourage and support loved ones in overcoming habits that enslave them or alienate, or alienate them from others. At times, he will call you to directly and lovingly intervene in the lives of fellow believers who have wandered from the truth and become ensnared in sin. If one of you, sh if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of, of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. What is the difference with what is the difference between constructive and destructive confrontation? Glaring differences separate constructive confrontation from destructive confrontation, and rightly so. One delivers hope, the other dashes hope. One dignifies the recipient, the other devastates the recipient. One delights God, the other one displeases God. Choose wisely which one you use because God holds you accountable for what you do. Everyone will have to give an account on that day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. Always hopes. Always perseveres. Love never fails. What categorizes the four confrontational styles of relating? Successful confrontation is contingent first on the successful identification of the relational style of the one being confronted, then on the realization that different styles require different approaches. If you walk blindly into a confrontation without taking into account the type of individual you are approaching, you may walk away scratching your head wondering what just happened and where you went wrong. Wisdom with good judgment calls for discernment when dealing with the problematic actions of others. Wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning, but a rod is for the back of him who has no sense. 
Proverbs chapter 10, verse 13. If you are involved in a conflict and you realize you need to confront, use good judgment and be careful not to make the mistake of using negative strategies, avoiding, attacking, or ambushing. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The lips of the righteous nourish many, but fools die for lack of sense. If you are a passive avoider, your strategy is to completely avoid the problem without ever addressing the person directly. You have a fear-based mentality, perhaps learned in childhood, that makes you feel unworthy or inadequate to confront. You are overly compliant because you want to avoid disagreement and you cower out of fear. By avoiding confrontation, you allow the sinful behavior of the other person to continue creating relational conflicts. The Bible records King Saul's confession, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instruction. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. If you are an aggressive attacker, your strategy is to attack the other person, not the problem. You build up your own self-esteem by attacking and suppressing others. You feel entitled to cross the personal boundaries of another person's space, work, time, or personal life. You seek to control others by intimidation. By attacking, you may win the momentary battle, but you lose the ultimate war. Your inappropriate attacks harm the relationship and, pro and provide no lasting resolution for correcting the offensive behavior. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5, the Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will go and punish. Be sure of this, they will not go and punish. If you are a passive aggressive ambusher, your strategy is to ambush the other person without confronting the problem. You are afraid and prefer hiding, manipulating, and ambushing in order to gain power rather than directly confronting. You keep a record of real or imagined offenses to justify getting even. You find it difficult to accept responsibility for hurting others, and you act as a sniper, shooting slander, sarcasm, and mockery from a distance. By ambushing, you avoid a direct confrontation. At the same time, you look for subtle ways to make a power play. Your relational conflicts are never resolved because you never deal with them. The Bible says mockers resent correction, so they avoid the wise. If you are an assertive activator, a positive approach, your strategy is to actively assert yourself by confronting in order to resolve the problem. You, de you deal fairly and respectively with everyone involved by listening carefully, stating the truth, correcting the untruth directly, and exposing areas where people differ or misunderstand one another. You make requests, taking the needs of others into account by courageously giving words of admonishment, rebuke, or encouragement when appropriate. By asserting yourself, you make positive relationships possible because you speak with discernment and confidently confront with sound judgment. In Proverbs chapter 3 verses 21 and 26, my son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion for the Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. Certain Certain other strategies may seem right for the moment, but they will not bring about godly results and will ultimately fail. Only an assertive strategy based on truth and applied with love will succeed and stand the test of time. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. I want to um, share a virtue today by A.W. Tauzer called Supernaturally Joyous. George Mueller would not preach 
until his heart was happy in the grace of God. Jan Ryusabrak would not write while his feelings were low, but would retire to a quiet place and wait on God till he felt the spirit of inspiration. It is well known that the elevated spirits of a group It is well known. It is well known that the elevated spirits of Moravians convinced John Wesley of the reality of their religion and helped bring him a short time later to a state of true conversion. The Christian owes it to the world to be supernaturally joyful.